Uh, good evening. So uh, today's topic for the day is uh, craniovertebral junction, and uh, we'll be covering it under two parts because it's a quite uh, long and complicated topic. So today we'll be covering the embryology of the CV junction, the anatomy of the craniovertebral junction, and uh, the biomechanics of how it works and how some changes can alter these biomechanics. Uh, in a later lecture, we'll cover the clinical features of pathology which involves the CV junction and how to evaluate it radiologically, followed by specific surgical techniques for C1-C2 instability. Okay, so first coming on to the embryology of the craniovertebral junction. Uh, so this is a slightly complicated topic and uh, you can easily get lost in it. So I hope you pay a little bit of attention. If there's any problems or any doubts, just uh, put them in the message box and I'll uh, answer them as soon as I can. So coming to the embryology of the CV junction, there are basically two components of the bony CV junction. There is basically a central pivot in the center, and that is made up of the dense, the C2 vertebral body, and the base occiput. And there are two ring structures which surround this bony CV junction, which include the foramen magnum and the C1 arch. The uh, central pillar or the central pivot is made up of the axial portions of occipital and upper two cervical sclerotomes. So we will come and discuss as to exactly what are sclerotomes later on. But basically, the axial portions or the central portions of these sclerotomes form the central pillar. The ring structures, on the other hand, are form formed from the lateral portions of the same exact sclerotomes with a small uh, portion which has come from something called a hypocaudal bow. And so we will be discussing what each of these structures are as we go on. So how it all starts is when uh, there's gastrulation, uh, there's formation of both the primitive streak and the neural plate. So cells will then migrate through the primitive streak and they will form mesoderm and they will migrate through the Hansen's node to form notochord. So we will not be discussing that in detail. So uh, as we can... Yeah, so as we can see over here, this uh, is the embryo, and this structure right here is the otic vesicle. And uh, the mesoderm, which is in front of the otic vesicle, is known as the precaudal mesoderm. So this precaudal mesoderm will not divide and it will not form somites. It will give rise to mesoderm structures without forming any somites. All the mesoderm posterior to the otic vesicle is going to be forming somites. So this uh, caudal to the pre-caudal mesoderm, as we can see here, it's a somatic region which is extending from the otic vesicle all the way to the blastopore. So this is a somatic region, and this is what is going to form somites. So before it forms somites, the pre-somatic mesoderm is what is it is known as. It is basically a loose cellular mesenchyme without any uh, particular structure. So how somitogenesis happens is that this loose mesenchyme, it will transform and then it will become tightly opposed epithelial cells as we can see over here. And they will have a definite polarity and they'll be surrounding this lumen which we can see over here. And somatogenesis will progress from rostral to caudal. So as you can see here, it will start in the rostral region and it will keep progressing caudally. So the first somite will always be formed immediately caudal to the otic vesicle. And then you have the further somites being added on uh, with time. So once these somites are formed, uh, they will then differentiate along the dorsoventral axis, anterior posteriorly. So the, uh, the that it is all induced by the notochord, which is located over here. So this is the neural tube, which is the blue and white structure, below which is the notochord. So the in this somites, the cells which are located ventromedially uh, in this uh, somatic, uh, somatic structure will migrate towards the notochord, and they will form a sclerotome. The cells which are located more laterally and dorsally will form the dermomyotome. So they will give rise to skin and muscle structures, while here the sclerotomes will give rise to the bone structures. Okay, this will further divide and the sclerotome will get resegmented after this. So the sclerotome, after it, it is first of all located ventromedially and around the notochord. So the cells which are located around the notochord over here, they will form something called the axial sclerotome. And this is a median axial cluster, so it's only one cluster. Then there are two paired lateral clusters located lateral to this axial sclerotome, which are called the lateral sclerotome. The lateral sclerotome and the axial sclerotome usually will divide into two halves. There will be a dense caudal half and there will be a loose cranial half. And these will be separated by the fissure of one ebner. So in the lateral sclerotome, which is this part, the cranial half does not form any bone. It just promotes the growth of the nerve which is supposed to come out from that particular neural foramen. The caudal half, on the other hand, it forms two structures. The side which is facing the axial sclerotome over here will form the more medial structures of the vertebral body and the pedicle, while the side which is facing away from the sclerotome, which is the axial sclerotome, will form the costal process, so more lateral processes. Right? 
so I'll, so how how all of this happens is that the somites which are uh, as we can see here this is these are the different somites they will resegment okay so as as, as we discussed there's a loose cranial half and a dense caudal half okay so the loose cranial half of one somite will join up with the dense caudal half of the somite above and it form a resegmented sclerotome over here okay so as we can see there's a dense half which is located in the resegmented sclerotome and a loose half and there is an axial part of that sclerotome and then there's a lateral part of the sclerotome so as we discussed in the lateral part of the sclerotome the loose half will not form any bony structure but just from the neural uh, it will just have the neural the nerve structures to grow out of that neural foramen the uh, dense structures on the other hand are going to end up forming the neural arch uh, when it comes to the uh, axial sclerotome, in the loose uh, half, that is basically uh, going to be forming your vertebral body. And the dense half is going to become even more dense in the cranial region. And it will form the intervertebral body zone. And in the rest of the spine, this intervertebral body zone will end up forming the annulus fibrosis of the disc. Okay, so neural uh, arch, as we discussed, is derived from the caudal lateral part of a single somite and only from the dense area of that. Okay, now as we know this, this structure here, this is the somite and then it gets resegmented into this somite above and the somite below. Okay, so the this somite's neural, uh, neural uh, structures will be coming out from this uh, neural foramen, but its pedicle will be located over here. So because of this resegmentation, a given spinal nerve will always be crossing above its own neural arch. Also, because of this, this uh, a, a given spinal cord segment will always be slightly more rostral because the resegmented sclerotome is going to be pushed caudally because of this resegmentation. Okay, so coming on to the different somites, the there are uh, a large number of somites, but the ones we really have to know about are from uh, basically one to uh, seven. So the occipital somites are the first four. And then the cervical somites are from five uh, up to basically uh, eight in number in total. And the transition somite between the skull and the cervical spine is between the fourth and the fifth somite. So the first four somites are four occipital somites, and then there are eight cervical somites. The first three occipital somites, as we saw, most somites will resegment. These occipital somites will not resegment to form. Uh, vertebral bodies they will join together and they will form loose and dense zones but they are not going to resegment and these will all fuse the axial sclerotomes will all fuse and form the rostral basi occipital that's basically where the clivus will arise from and the lateral part of these sclerotomes will also be forming dense and loose zones but uh, the dense zones will form the hypoglossal canal and the loose zones will promote growth of the hypoglossal nerve. So that is the difference between the occipital and cervical somites. The occipital uh, somites will also have an axial and a lateral sclerotome, but the axial sclerotomes will not resegment. They will not form loose and dense zones. They will completely fuse together and just form the rostral base occipital. The lateral sclerotomes, on the other hand, will resegment. They will form dense and loose zones. Dense zone will give rise to bone, that is a hypoglossal canal, and the loose zone will just help the hypoglossal nerve grow out. The occipital somites that we saw that was just for the first three occipital somites. The fourth occipital somite will resegment. So this will again form a caudal dense zone and a cranial loose zone. Okay, and uh, so the caudal dense zone of the fourth occipital somite will fuse with the cranial loose half of the fifth somite, which is also the first cervical somite, and it will form this resegmented sclerotome that is known as the pro atlas. So as, as it's pretty obvious from its name, it should give rise to some structures of the atlas. So we'll see what happens. So this cranial part of the proatlas over here, which is formed from the fourth somite, which is an occipital somite. Okay. So this will fuse with the axial occipital sclerotome as the sclerotomes are located above from the first, second and third somites. So they will fuse together and they will form the basion over here. So this is going to be arising from the proatlas. The caudal part of the proatlas over here is going to give rise to the precursor of the dense apex. The dense is basically divided into three uh, two, two, two structures. This is the C2 body, which is separate. The dense has an apical structure and a basal structure. So the apical part of the dense is going to be arising from the proatlas itself. Then uh, the cleavage which happens between these this cranial and caudal part is what is going to basically separate your uh, skull and your spine. Okay, so the lateral dense region of the, so that the structures we discussed only come from the axial sclerotome. 
okay so we still have the lateral sclerotome left over here so the lateral sclerotome as we know has a dense region and a loose region so the dense region is going to form the ex occipitals or basically the occipital condyles and the anterior part of the foramen magnum while the loose region over here as we always know loose region just gives rise to no bone and helps form the nerve roots so it's going to help promote the formation of c1 nerve root okay apart from that the dense pro atlas cells will migrate and they will form a structure this ventral to the notochord okay over here or basically over here sorry over here this is the hypocaudal bow which is arising from the proatlas there's a hypocaudal bow which also arises from this first cervical sclerotome that is a separate structure okay this is the hypocaudal bow which is arising from the proatlas okay and this hypocaudal bow is going to give rise to the anterior cervical tubercle so we have gone through whatever structures arise from the proatlas and it is important to realize after all of that is that basically no atlas structure arises from the proatlas coming to the cervical somites uh, as we know the first four somites are the occipital somites and the fifth somite is the cervical somite so the caudal half of fifth as we know the cranial half of fifth somite will join with the fourth and form the proatlas Okay, that that is a resegmented sclerotome, while the caudal half of fifth will join with the cranial half of sixth somite and will form the first cervical sclerotome. So this is the first cervical sclerotome over here. Okay, and that again has an axial part and it has uh, it has a lateral sclerotome. So the axial sclerotome again has a dense uh, cranial half and a loose caudal half, and the uh, lateral part again has a dense cranial half and a loose caudal half. So the loose zone of the first cervical sclerotome. here will form the basal dense okay and the loose zone of the second cervical sclerotome over here will form the body of the axis now if you remember the dense zones they are supposed to become even more dense and they are supposed to form something called the intervertebral body zone which gives rise to the disc but there are no discs in the c1 c2 region so these do not form disc they form what are basically dental synchondroses these are the joints which are basically located between the apical and the basal dental segment and maybe the basal dental segment and the c2 vertebral body so that is what the dense structures which are in the axial sclerotome give rise to they give rise to the upper and the lower dental synchondroses while the loose caudal half is what gives rise to from from the first cervical sclerotome to the basal dense from the second cervical sclerotome to the body of c2 okay so uh, just to understand what the axis is formed from the axis has three parts the apical dental segment the basal dental segment and the body of the axis so the apical dental segment arises from the caudal proatlas as we saw over here okay it this from this region will be sure okay Huh. and the basal dental segment the is going to arise from the first cervical sclerotome over here and the body of the axis is going to arise from the second cervical sclerotome over here so the three different components and three different sclerotomes are giving rise to the axis so uh, and uh, a lot of it is clinically important and it is important to remember as to exactly when these structures will ossify so we don't get confused with fractures so all three segments first have to undergo a chondrification and all the chondrification happens simultaneously at around 6 feet of gestation and ossification occurs in three waves the first wave is really within the axial body itself happening at 4 month of gestation the second one will be on the in the basal dental segment there will be two centers over here and they will appear within at 6 months of gestation at birth both the centers should fuse together so at birth you should have a single basal dense segment and the main part of the dense will begin fusing with the body of c2 at birth itself but this fusion can have can be completed at only around 5 to 6 years of age so before 5 to 6 years of age you will see a rarefication between the basal dense segment and the c2 body there's a third wave which happens around 3 to 5 years in uh, the apical dense but the bony fusion of the upper sid chondrosis will not happen until adolescence so the important ages to remember are 5 to 6 years of age that is the point at which the lower sid chondrosis should have fused and there should be no rarefaction there and adolescence that is where the upper sid chondrosis should have fused and there should be no rarefaction there okay so we have discussed the axial sclerotomes but what do the lateral sclerotomes of these resegmented sclerotomes give rise to for the first cervical sclerotome the dense zone will give rise to the posterior arch of the atlas okay and the second cervical dense zone will give rise to the arch of the axis okay and as we know the loose zones will help the first and the second cervical nerve come out the the first cervical sclerotome the dense cells also will migrate in front of the notochord then they will form something called the hypocaudal bow 
And this hypochordal bow of the first cervical sclerotome gives rise to the anterior arch of the atlas. Okay, so it is important to remember that absolutely no atlas structure arises from the proatlas. The anterior arch of the atlas arises from the hypochordal bow, not the hypochordal bow of the proatlas, but the hypochordal bow of the first cervical resegmented sclerotome. The uh, posterior arch of the atlas, on the other hand, arises from the first cervical sl resegmented sclerotome, this denso. It is slightly complicated, but that is just how this embryology is. Okay, so that is how the cervical, the craniovertebral junction arises. And now we'll discuss as to how this embryology gives rise to the different types of pathology. Okay, so basically you can have defects of the axial sclerotome and they will give rise to defects of the central pillar. So that, that will be abnormalities basically in the dens and the clivus. So this could be platybasia, brachybasia, basal kyphosis, basal invagination, retroflex dens, and cerebral ectopia. And we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail as we go on. You can also have defects more laterally and in the hypochordal bow. So that's where you will give rise to problems of the lateral clival rim, the occipital condyles, the atlantal arches, and the C1 and C2 lateral masses, the structures which are basically arising from the lateral part of the sclerotome. Okay, so this is a method of classifying the bony malformation of the CV junction according to embryogenesis. It is just important to remember that there are malformations of the central pillar and there are malformations of the surrounding rings. So malformations of the central pillar can involve the dents and malformations of the central pillar can involve the basally occiput or basically the clivus. Okay, and there can be malformations of surrounding rings. The surrounding rings basically lies on two structures, that is the proatlas and the semen sclerotome. So if they arise on the proatlas, they will cause Issues basically are, uh, related to the skull base. If there are some C1 sclerotome, they will mostly be affecting the C1 arch. Okay, so let's discuss the anomalies of the central pillar. The anomalies of the central pillar, as we saw, basically will affect the dense axis complex and the base occiput. The first one is odontoid dysgenesis itself. So the formation of the dense requires four phases. First, you form the mesoderma primordium, then you have to turn it into cartilage, then it has to ossify, and then finally the upper and the lower dental synchondrosis have to fuse. So all of these stages can give rise to different problems. So if you do not even form the mesodermal structure, you're not you're just going to have aplasia or hypoplasia of the sclerot of the sclerotomes of the proatlas and the first cervical sclerotome. As we know, the proatlas gives rise to the apical dense, and the first cervical sclerotome gives rise to the basal dense. Okay, so you can have an agenesis of the apical segment, and this is the most common type of this anomaly. The dense will be short but still it will be tall enough to accommodate the transverse atlantal ligament. So as long as any structure has enough space for the transverse atlantal ligament, it is not going to cause instability. So even though the dense is slightly short, it is tall enough that TL can attach, and so there's no instability in agenesis of the apical segment. When you have complete agenesis of the, both the dental components, obviously there's no way for TL to attach, and instability is present. If there's an agenesis of just the basal component, you have a stumpy dental pivot, just thus basically the origin of the uh, dense from the C2 body, and a separate floating apical ossicle. There's no central part, there's no basal dense. So obviously TL cannot attach, and instability again will be present. You can also have a disturbance of the intervertebral body zone mesenchyme. So as we know, in the C1, C2 region, this mesenchyme is supposed to form the upper and the lower dental synchondrosis, okay, and does not form any disc in this region. So as we know, the uh, for, uh, from the proatlas, that IBZ will form the uh, upper dental synchondrosis. From the first two cervical sclerotomes, the lower dental synchondrosis. So os odontoidium is basically a non-fusion of the lower dental synchondrosis. Okay, so you have the entire dense as a separate structure, and then you have the axis as a separate structure. There has been a lot of debate uh, historically as to whether os odontoidium is a developmental anomaly versus a traumatic uh, fracture. And it is still not very clear, but most likely it is a developmental anomaly because of its congenital association. Okay, a way to differentiate between these structures would be to check the relation to the C2 lateral mass. If the uh, line of separation is above the C2 lateral mass, most likely it's a fracture. Since the os is not attached to the C2 body, there is nowhere for this PL to attach and stabilize the C2, and so instability will be present. Ossiculum terminal persistence, on the other hand, is an unfused apical dental segment. So it's a very small segment which is not fused with the basal dens. So because basal dens is still fused, there is enough space for the TL to attach. If for whatever reason this dental pivot turns out to be short, there can be instability, but otherwise, usually in ossiculum terminal persistence, there should be no instability.
Okay, so another structure, another uh, anomaly which can arise in, is an abnormal resegmentation of the pro atlas centrum. So in this, what happens is uh, you develop an anomaly known as os avis. So instead of, as we know, basically there is a resegmentation which happens at the level of the pro atlas and the cranial at the caudal half, and it's supposed to separate the skull base from the spine. So here the resegmentation actually shifts caudally. So the apical dental segment actually ends up being fused to the basi occiput instead of trying to fuse to the dental stem. So as so it is quite similar to the uh, osculum terminal in that this segment is not fused to the dents. Okay, so instability may or may not be present. That, that depends on whether the dental pivot is short or it is tall. This, because of abnormal resegmentation, can also affect other structures apart from just the apical dental segment and be associated with an absent C1 arch or an occipitalized atlas, all of it arising from abnormal resegmentation. The, uh, another, another abnormality which can arise in central pillar is that, as we saw, there are supposed to be two ossification centers for the basal dents, and these two ossification centers should fuse before birth itself. So uh, when these two segments, these two ossification centers don't fuse, they can give rise to something known as a bifid dens. This is different from something which is known as a dense bicornus. Here, the tip of the dens is going to be bicornuate. And so what we can see here is a dense bicornus. Here, just the tip is bicornuate. And this is not the same as a bifid dens. And a dense bicornus is not associated with instability. In the bifid dens, the whole dens, this whole structure should be bifid, all the way up to the lower synchondrosis. Because midline integration is affected, it will also affect fusion of the synchondrosis. So usually it can be associated even with os and osculum terminal. Instability will always be present in a bifid dense because the central pivot is hypoplastic. Okay, uh, the most common anomaly that all of us probably know about right now, by now is the uh, is basilar impression or imagination. So basilar impression is actually not pushing up of the dense into the posterior fossa contents. It's actually a drop of the posterior fossa contents onto the erect dense. And that is happening predominantly because of a skull base anomaly. The anomaly is not in the dense itself. The anomaly is in the skull base. Okay, so that causes the posterior fossa contents to drop down. And that is because of a shallow occipital box. This whole posterior fossa is going to be shallow and the skull base is going to be flattened. Because it is flattened, the posterior fossa contents fall down and they're going to impinge on this erect dense which is present over there. So there are three basic types of congenital basilar impression. There's an anterior, there's a posterior, and there's a combined. In the anterior basilar impression, there are basically changes which happen anteriorly, okay? That is at the basi occipital complex, okay? The clivus becomes flat, and that is known as platybasia, okay? The platybasia is often going to be accompanied along with a short clivus because of all the uh, congenital anomalies present in the mesodermal structures over there. So that short clivus is defined as less than 3.2 centimeters. Because the clivus is short and it is flat, this basion, located at the inferior border of the clivus, at the foramen magnum anteriorly, is going to move up. It is moving cranially, and the foramen magnum, which is supposed to be horizontal, will end up tilting. It will become lordotic. Okay, and it will tilt upwards in a lordotic angle. Okay, because of this lordosis, which is happening quite early, it will force the upper cervical sclerotome, which is still forming, to also bend backwards. And that is how a retroflex tense happens. Okay, it is secondary to the changes happening at the level of the basi occipital complex. You have first get platybasia and short clivus, secondary to which you get the foramen magnum being tilted and becoming lordotic, because of which you get a retroflexed and lordotic dense. So all of it is secondary. There's also something known as the posterior basilar invagination, and this is because of, a, because of two possible anomalies. One is that there's a problem with the X occipitals. They're not properly formed, and they rise up towards the foramen magnum, and the ophistheon will shift upwards because of this. Okay, that is one problem which can give rise to posterior basilar impression, or it can be because the occipital condyles are flat. If the occipital condyles are flat, the whole C1, C2 complex moves upward. Okay, so that, is, that can also cause posterior basilar impression. All of this causes the dense to secondarily elevate into the cranial cavity. But unlike the anterior basilar impression, it will not be retroflexed or lordotic. Okay, so the ophistern, as we can see over here, will invaginate into the cranial aperture. So this uh, particular image is of both a combined anterior and a posterior form of basilar invagination. So here, as you can see, it is a flat clivus. It is also a short clivus. And the dense is retroflexed and lordotic. 
there's also a posterior basal R impression because this ovation is turned inwards. OK, so we can also have anomalies of the surrounding ring structure. So those are the, all the anomalies of the central pillar. But now we come to the anomalies of central of the surrounding ring structures. And these are a little different than the anomalies of the central pillar because most likely they might not cause instability. A few of them do, so we'll come across this. So you can have anomalies of proactylus. As we know, the proactylus gives rise to something called as the hypocaudal bow. And this hypocaudal bow is supposed to give rise to over here the anterior clival tubercle. Okay, if this hypertrophies, it can form something known as a third occipital condyle. If it significantly hypertrophies, it forms this U-shaped structure over here. And this is nothing to worry about usually. But if it hypertrophies quite a bit, it can jut backwards and it can cause neural compression. This structure, because it is so large and compared to a normal uh, of, uh, basion, can be mistaken for an os avis. But it is important to remember that in this uh, type of pathology, the dense height will be normal. Okay, and that is not what happens in an osseavis where the dense height will be short. The uh, in the proatlas, the lateral part of the proatlas can also hypertrophy, and that is what is going to lead to the hypertrophy of the ex occipital, which leads to the hypertrophy of the occipital condyle. Okay, so the occipital condyle, if it's bilaterally hypertrophy, it can impinge into the center into the spinal canal and cause cervicomedullary compression. But if it is just unilaterally hypertrophy, it can still distort the brainstem, but predominantly will produce only chronic neck pain and stiffness. You can also have one of the most common anomalies of the CV junction, that is a non-resegmentation of the proatlas. The proatlas does not divide properly. Okay, and then the atlas gets assimilated. So basically what happens here is that the segmentation line shifts caudally. So the atlas becomes a part of the skull base instead of being separate from it. So uh, the atlas assimilation can be complete or incomplete. Zone 1 is just the anterior arch, zone 2 is the lateral processes, and zone 3 is the posterior arch being fused with the occiput. The problem with uh, assimilation of the atlas is that because the atlas is assimilated down to the occiput, it cannot move separately. So the first mobile segment actually from C0, C1 shifts to C1, C2. And that leads to significantly high motion stresses and that causes the ligaments to fail. Okay, And that is why assimilation of atlas is associated with instability because of all the stresses. Another very common problem with assimilation of atlas is the vertebral artery anomalies which are associated with it. Okay, so that is about the embryology of the craniovertebral junction. So uh, that was the main topic for today. So the next two topics should be a little bit uh, smaller and simpler to understand. So we'll go on to the anatomy of the craniovertebral junction. This will be a little bit uh, short and not very detailed, just a sm uh, small idea. So uh, the craniovertebral junction is not just C1, C2. It also includes the occipital bone. So. If we look at the occipital bone, all of you can uh, also access this uh, 3D structure for other bones as well uh, in, on this site. So uh, the occipital bone, the important structures that we should know about when it comes to uh, one second. the craniovertebral junction is obviously the foramen magnum. Okay, then the foramen magnum anterior rim is where is the basion over here. The foramen magnum posterior rim is where we are going to find the ophistheon over here. Okay, and then we have the occipital condyles. The occipital condyles, as we can see, are going to be situated anteriorly in the foramen magnum and they are pointed medially and inferiorly and anteriorly. Okay, in the occipital condyle, at the junction of the med of the posterior one third and the medial and the middle one third, that is where the hypoglossal canal is located. That is also an important structure when it comes to the occipital bone. Okay, so the occipital bone is basically shaped like a trapezoid. It has four different regions. That is all fine. The important structures on the occipital bone are the ophistheon, the superior and inferior nuchal line, because that is important for dissection of this region, uh, the lateral surfaces with the occipital condyles, and the hypoglossal canal. When it comes to the atlas, the atlas is a very, very different uh, structure from the rest of the spine. Okay, as we can see, there is no central component of the atlas. There is no central body. Okay, it has two arches, the very short anterior arch and a much longer posterior arch. Okay, and then the lateral masses. 
Okay, the lateral masses have two components, the superior facet and the inferior facet. Okay, the superior facet is concave and it is pointed medially and upwards to articulate with the occipital condyle. The inferior facet is also going to be slanting from medial to lateral downwards. So it is important to remember that in the lateral mass, the medial border is going to be much shorter than the lateral border. Both of, our, both of them are sloping downwards like this. Okay, then another important structure apart from the lateral masses is that lat uh, this uh, transverse process. The transverse process has this transverse uh, has this foramen transverse area through which the vertebral artery comes up and enters, following which it runs behind the lateral mass, okay, in the uh, vertebral artery groove, and in front of the vertebral artery will run the C1 nerve root. So the nerve root will always be in front of the vertebral artery. There's also a tubercle over here, as we can see, on the lateral mass on both sides. On this tubercle is where the transverse atlantal ligament attaches. Okay, so as we saw, there are two arches. There are lateral masses, transverse processes, anterior tubercle, uh, which is on the anterior arch. And that is where the anterior longitudinal ligament and longus coli will attach. There's also a posterior facet around the anterior arch where the, it will articulate with the odontoid to form a synovial joint. And then we saw the C1, C2 articulation with the inferior facet, and that is responsible for most of the cervical spine rotation, axial rotation, that is. The posterior arch also has a tubercle that gives rise to muscle and ligament attachments. And we discussed the groove of the vertebral artery. The atlas, uh, as we know, uh, has a medial protuberance known as the colliculus atlantis, and that is where the TL will attach. The uh, important thing about atlas is it can have significant variations. So this is something known as the ponticulus posticus, and that is basically that the vertebral artery groove will be completely or incompletely encircled by a bony canal. Okay, So this is present in various studies in 1 to 37% of individuals. And this can be quite helpful because if you're dissecting in this region, if it, is in a, if it is in this bony canal, it is very difficult to damage the vertebral artery. The other important uh, defect uh, variations which can be seen are uh, the occipitalization of the atlas, which leads to instability, and defects in the posterior arch of the atlas, which should not lead to instability. We also have the axis bone, which is also very different from other uh, uh, spinal uh, vertebral bones, but a little bit more similar. At least it has a central body. So this is the central pillar or the uh, centrum of the C2. And obviously it has a dense which is attached to it, followed by this is where most people get confused. This structure over here, that is what is known as a pedicle of C2. Okay, so this is in, from the front, this is the pedicle. The pedicle is what attaches the C2 centrum to the pass. Okay, so this structure, including the superior facet, including its inferior facet, is what is known as the pars. So this, this part is the pars interarticularis, and it gives rise to the superior facet and the inferior facet. So the structure which joins the C2 centrum with the, sorry, with the pars is what is known as a pedicle over here. This is the pedicle. Okay, and then you have the laminae which are quite large as compared to laminae of other spinous processes, of the other uh, cervical vertebrae. And you have a bifid spinous process. Okay. So the uh, other important things about the C2 vertebral body are that th the superior facet, which articulates with the C1 lateral mass, is located a lot more anteriorly as compared to the inferior facet. And this facet is almost horizontal, while this facet is almost sagittal. Okay, and then you also have the vertebral artery foramen. As you can see, this is where the vertebral artery is supposed to enter. Okay, and this is a lot medial as compared to where it is supposed to exit over here. That is why the vertebral artery turns laterally when it enters the C2. Now, this relationship of the vertebral artery cave, what the structure is called, okay, with the pedicle and with the superior facet is what decides if there is going to be enough space for you to enter a, a transpedicular screw or a transarticular screw. If this cave is basically jutting up into this facet, you're not going to have enough space for a screw. Okay. Right. So we discussed the odontal process. We discussed, and then the tip of the dense has two very important ligaments that attach to the uh, uh, clivus. Uh, that is the apical and the ala ligaments. The axis, as we discussed, has larger laminae compared to other cervical vertebrae. It has a bifid spinous process. Uh, 
The transverse processes do not have tubercles as the rest of the cervical spine does. And as we saw, the transverse foramen is positioned medial laterally. So the vertebral artery has to travel more laterally as it's going. Okay, coming to the ligaments of the craniovertebral junction. The ligaments of the craniovertebral junction, there are many. Okay, and it is easy to get confused, but uh, it's really nothing to worry about. Okay, most of them are just atlanto-occipital membranes. There will be there will be an at anterior atlanto-occipital membrane, there will be a lateral atlanto-occipital membrane, and there will be a posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. These membranes really do not do much. They really don't provide a lot of significant stability. The most important ligaments are basically two. That is the alar ligament, okay, and uh, basically the transverse atlantal ligament. Another important ligament is a tectorial membrane, but the two most important ligaments <laughs> are the alar ligament and the transverse ligaments. So the transverse ligament is the main stabilizer of the atlanto axial joint, and the alar ligament is the main structure which prevents excessive axial rotation around the segment C2 joint. So coming to what these ligaments look like, so if we remove the spinal cord and we look from posteriorly towards the ligaments, the first structure we will see is the tectorial membrane. Okay, behind the tectorial membrane is where you will see arising from the dents, the apical ligament, okay, which is going to attach to the basion over here. Okay, from the dents laterally, you will also see the ala ligament, which is going to uh, enter, uh, which is going to attach to the occipital condyles. So these are very important structures which help stabilize the dents. Another important structure is the transverse ligament over here. The transverse ligament which joins up with the PLL is going to form the tectorial membrane. Okay. The other important uh, ligaments would be the capsular ligaments, so which are around the atlanto-occipital and the atlanto-axial joints. Okay, so these are all the different uh, ligaments in different planes. So you have the cruciate ligament or the, uh, the sorry, the cruciate ligament uh, in front of which I uh, think I got confused there slightly. The tectorial membrane is a separate structure and the cruciate ligament is a separate structure. So the tech, uh, so this cruciate ligament is basically a ligament which connects the C2 with the clivus over here. The tectorial membrane is, a, uh, is the extension of the PLL superiorly. So the tectorial membrane has a has, so the cruciate ligament has a superior crust and inferior crust and the transverse atlantal ligament. Apart from that, other structures which uh, don't really help to stabilize but are present are the anterior and the posterior atlantooxial membrane and lateral atlantooxial membrane. Okay, so similar structures uh, as we can see uh, after cutting up the different areas of the bones. Okay, this is your cruciate ligament with the superior crust, inferior crust, and the transverse atlantal ligament. And from the dense, you will get these alar ligaments. And behind this, you will find the apical ligament. Okay, so that is about the anatomy of the craniovertebral junction. And then we'll go on to the last part of, the, of today's discussion. That is the biomechanics of how this craniovertebral junction functions and how it works. Okay, so uh, just a basic concept. There are basically three axes around which these uh, bones will uh, move, and they allow for different rotation. Okay, uh, this the x-axis allows for flexion extension, the y-axis allows for axial rotation, and the z-axis allows for lateral bending. Okay, you can also have translation along these axes, but the primary motion along these axes is going to be rotation. Okay, so the bio, so biomechanics are obviously not tested on living beings. They're tested only on uh, uh, bones or uh, dead animals. So uh, basically, how it is done is through flexibility testing. A load is applied, and whatever is the motion is measured. Okay, and the motion is measured for a single vertebra in relation to its adjacent vertebra, and that single vertebra which we're measuring movement for is known as a motion segment. And for every motion segment, you measure its stiffness and flexibility, which are basically uh, opposite terms. Stiffness is how much movement it allows uh, for a given force, and the opposite of that is flexibility. Then the uh, then the physiological range of movement for that motion. Then there are three different zones, which are the neutral zone, the lag zone, and the elastic or stiff zone. So what are these? Uh, so this is the load deformation curve for a particular motion segment. Okay, uh, as you can see here, this is the range of motion in flexion, and this is the range of motion in extension. Okay, and this is what is known as a neutral or the resting position. Also, the neutral or resting position is basically the point at where there are no joint stresses and basically no muscle effort is required to keep the joint in that position. To move from this, one second. Yeah. So to move from this uh, line, I, in either way, it requires some of the other load to be applied. Okay, and basically the amount of uh, deformation 
which is generated by the load applied that decides actually, what are these different zones. Okay, so there's a lag zone and there's a stiff zone. The lag zone is where uh, basically the uh, ligaments are lax and whatever force you apply will be able to produce a significant amount of displacement because the ligaments are lax, they're not, they're not taut. Okay, once you cross the lag zone, you enter the stiff zone. That is where you are at the ed end of your range of motion and the ligaments become taut. So you're not going to be able to move how much ever force you apply until you break the ligament uh, integrity. So this is a stiff zone and this is the lag zone for this particular joint. Okay, and, the and from one end to the other end is your range of motion. Okay, so as we discussed, that is a st uh, stiff zone in the range of motion. And the flexibility is basically this this line. Flexibility is measured basically in the stiff zone, and that is how much force you require in the stiff zone to produce deformation. Okay, so when it comes to the CV junction, the different joints have different range of motions. Okay, so the C0, C1 joint predominantly does not allow for axial rotation and for lateral bending. There's a very minimal amount of that happening here. It does allow for a significant amount of flexion extension though. Okay, but it is very rigid in axial rotation and lateral bending. On the other hand, C1, C2 is where 50% of the axial rotation of the cervical spine happens. Okay, so it is the most unstable joint of the spine. Okay, so uh, the uh, it, it also does allow for some flexion extension, but as we can see, C0, C1, and C1, C2 joints barely allow for any lateral bending. Okay, so the uh, how injury happens is that the predominant vector decides what is going to be injured because of the different motion segments. So if there's a central force which is uh, compressing the uh, axial structures, the most common structure which gets damaged is the C1 arch. Okay, and for, uh, this leads to a Jefferson fracture. So this is from a vertical compression injury, which is acting centrally on the central pillar. If it acts more posteriorly, it is going to lead to an extension force. Okay, and that, it, I'm sorry, one second. And that is what can lead to posterior lateral fractures. Okay, and uh, on the other hand, if you have, apply a rotational torque force, which is causing the head to move back, it's an extension injury, okay, applied from anterior to posteriorly, that is what leads to a Hammond's fracture, that is a C2 pass interarticularis fracture. Uh, different forces applied vertically at different angles to the central pillar can also fracture the dents at different levels leading to type 1, type 2, and type 3 fractures. A force applied on the C1 anteriorly, a significant enough force can disrupt a transfer of lateral ligament, leading to C1, C2 instability. And a torque which is applied laterally can also lead to rotatory axial instability. Okay, so uh, when these ligaments fail, what actually happens? As we saw, the main ligaments which are important are the alar ligament and the atla transverse atlantal ligament. So these two ligaments, we should see that if they fail, there would there should be some instability. So the alar ligament, as we know, is going to stabilize the spine during flexion extension, but its main job is to limit axial rotation, also lateral bending. So if it is lig if it is disrupted only on one side, you just get a rotatory AI because it is not able to limit rotation. And so C1 and C2 move uh, move as we saw over here in, in a rotatory fashion, leading to a rotatory instability. Uh, so that's an increased C1, C2 range of motion only during axial rotation. If the bilateral ligaments are disrupted, we will not be able to stabilize flexion extension and lateral bending also. So that is when you get significant instability. You have instability in all three motions. Okay, so that so it is important to remember that if it's just unilaterally disrupted, it's okay. You have some modest rotatory AI, but if it's bilaterally disrupted, the entire C1 3 2 joint is significantly unstable. A transverse ligament failure, as we know, it's the most important ligament of the entire spine. If it is disrupted, the C1 is going to be grossly unstable. Another important ligament is uh, the capsular ligament. So capsular ligaments, if they are the ones which are stabilizing the C1 C2 joint, but if they are disrupted, there's generally no significant uh, instability which arises. There is a going to be a slight increase in the range of motion in the axial rotation, but there is no significant instability. So the important structures that are giving rise to instability are transverse ligament and alar ligament failure. Now what happens if we go in and we remove the dents, if we do a trans or odontoidectomy, uh, is there any instability that we induce? So because we remove the dents, 
obviously there is going to be instability. As we saw, wherever the dental pivot is absent, there is nowhere for the TL to attach, and there is going to be instability. So there's significant increase in the laxity of C1. It just moves around freely. You know? Okay, so the range of motion and the lag zone of the C1 C2 joint will increase during flexion extension and during lateral bending, but not during axial rotation because our RR ligaments will still be intact. The translational movements of C1 will increase significantly, and the rotation of and the center rotation will become more widely distributed, allowing you to have a lot of instability. Okay, and this predominantly happens in patients when we remove it for uh, conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. In 90% of these patients, they will develop instability. So whenever you're removing the dents in these patients, you have to do a C1-C2 fusion. But already, whether there's pre-existing fusions which are present, or C1 arch is assimilated, there's only a 50% risk of instability. So in those cases, if you remove the dents, you might not require a C1-C2 fixation. Okay, coming to the biomechanics of different internal fixation devices as to uh, how stable they are and uh, how much uh, fixation they provide. So odontoid screw, even if you put one screw, even if you put two screws, they will never be able to reach to the original strength of the dents. Okay, even after fixating, the strength will still be half only. And permanent stability will happen only after the fracture heals. Okay, so whenever you put an odontoid screw, it is important that the patient should be on a semi-rigid orthosis because until the bone heals, that fracture fragment is still basically unstable. Only half the strength is present. When it comes to C1, C2 fixation, one of the most commonly used methods until about a decade ago was the posterior wide bone uh, graft fixation. This is basically where a bone graft is taken and inserted either just on the dorsal to the C1 and C2 lamina, uh, posterior arch and lamina, or at least wedged in between. Okay, so it was found that when this bone graft is wedged in between C1 and C2, it is much more effective at providing stability than simply putting it on lay. But cable techniques, whatever you do, can only limit 20 to 50 percent of the motion, which is uh, occurring now because of instability. And with time, this will become loose and it will become unstable. So whenever you do cable fixation, it is important to supplement fixation with something else. Okay, a uh, very the most stable fixation method for uh, C1 C2 is actually the trans articular screws, and uh, this, as we know, is going to go from the uh, C2 lateral mass into the C1 lateral mass. So, from the C2 facet into the C1 lateral mass. Okay, so it is going to basically stick this C1 lateral mass and the C2 facet together. So, movement cannot happen. Okay, but the important thing here is that as it is passing through the center of rotation in the sagittal plane, okay, because it passes through that, it cannot limit flexion extension. Okay, it can limit axial rotation and lateral bending, but it cannot limit flexion extension. That is why C1 uh, strands articular screws are weak in resisting flexion extension. Okay, and uh, that is why whenever you do trans articular screws, you should also do a C1 C2 wiring because it will help you limit flexion extension. The other uh, method of fixing C1 C2 is a C1 C2 screw fixation. You can either put it in the C1 lateral mass and C2 trans particular screws or C1 lateral mass and C2 laminar screws. And we will be discussing a lot more in detail about these uh, types of screws in the next seminar. Uh, the Here, as we saw, trans articular screws will fix the jo joint through the joint itself. While these screws, they will fix the joint a lot more posteriorly, in basically over here where the rod is present. Because they're fixating the joint farther posterior than a trans screw will fix it, the construct moves posteriorly. Because it moves posteriorly, it is away from the axis and it is not going to be able to res uh, resist movement as much as a trans screw. That is why a C1, C2 lateral mass trans screw is going to be weaker than trans screw. So these are different uh, range of motions that are allowed following these different um, fixations. As we can see, the black the black uh, graph is the transarticular screw. The white one is the C1 lateral mass and C2 parts, and the hash and the uh, uh, hashed uh, segment is the interlaminar screw. So, in basically every movement, the interlaminar screw does not work as well as the C1 lateral mass C2 part screw. At least an extension of the C1 lateral mass C2 pass screw works better than the transarticular screw. But in everything else, this transarticular screw is more stable than all the other screw uh, constructs. The cervical orthosis, on the other hand, if you are using a soft collar, you buy, basically might as well not use a soft collar. Okay, so it, is, it does not do much. It, it is basically an irritating reminder that please don't move your neck. It is not going to restrict normal motion. Okay, so maximum restriction it provides is for lateral bending and that is it will still allow up to 80% of movement. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Uh, obviously, as we can see, this fixation is going to be more rigid than any other fixation. This is the halo vest, and it only allows about 10% of movement in all three planes. Okay, so that is it for this uh, for today's seminar. So I'm hoping all of you got a basic understanding of how the CV junction functions and how it is formed and what is uh, anatomy. And next, as we go forward, so we'll discuss its pathology, how to evaluate and how to treat these pathologies. So a few pra practice questions uh, just to check as to how much you've understood. And uh, then we can also discuss the same topics again. So uh, for these questions, just if you uh, wish to answer, please just put the message or uh, the answer in the chat box and I'll have a look at it. OK, so this is a four-year-old child. And uh, please identify this anomaly. OK, so we'll discuss a few options. I'm sorry. So let's see, what do we think this is? Is it a traumatic dense fracture? Is it an os? Is it a normal anatomy, or is it an os avis? OK, so um, as any. Yeah, so uh, the answer is that it is a normal anatomy because as we discussed, the basal synchondrosis is supposed to fuse with the C2 body at maximum five to six years. So you have to wait till five to six years for this to have completely fused before saying it is abnormal. Okay, next question, identify this anomaly. OK, so these are the options. Is it an agenesis of the basal dense segment? Is it a bifid dense? Is it an os or an interdium? Or is it a bifid corner? Okay, so the important structure to look over here is this. Okay, so this is basically a bifid dense. We've already seen what a bifid corner looks like. This a bifid corner would just have the tip of the dense being bifid. Okay, this is not an ons os because we have this structure over here. Okay, and this structure over here. If you look closely, it is bifid over here. Okay, and we know when there's a midline uh, a fusion problem, there's also going to be problems with the uh, central pillar. That is why these areas are hypoplastic. So it is not an os; it is a bifid dense. And a bifid dense, as you can see, this uh, central pillar is very hypoplastic. It is going to be associated with instability. There could uh, the uh, this problem is a problem of uh, fusion. OK, so the problem uh, has happened because of ossification and those ossifications that is fusing. So most likely, there is going to be cartilage there. But cartilage is obviously not going to function as well to prevent instability. Right, so which of the following is going to be the strongest implant which resists flexion extension forces at C1, C2? Is it C1, C2 wiring? Is it transarticular screws? Is it C1 lateral mass screws and C2 transparticular screws? Or is it transarticular screws with posterior wiring? Yeah, so the answer is uh, transarticular screws with posterior wiring. The posterior wiring adds a significant component which helps you resist flexion extension forces. As we saw in the graph before, the transarticular screws, uh, they're quite close to C1 lateral mass screws and C2 transparticular screws when it comes to resisting flexion extension, but 
the in extension they are slightly weaker so adding this posterior wiring makes them the strongest uh, implant for resisting flexion extension forces okay so the most simple question ala ligament primarily resists which of these forces Okay, yes. So the answer is axial rotation. It resists primarily axial rotation. Just remember how it attaches, and you'll be able to remember what it resists. Okay, so that is all for today. Thank you so much for attending this class. If there are any doubts, you can just let me know. I'll be waiting here for one to two minutes to answer any questions.